Okay, so hello and welcome to another in our occasional series on Jersey City history. Uh, I'm John Beekman. I'm the manager of the New Jersey Room at the Jersey City Free Public Library. And I'm joined today by Matthew Kruer from the University of Chicago, who has agreed to come and talk to us a little bit about his research into the uh, Susquehannock peoples of what is now Pennsylvania in the colonial uh, era of the prehistory of the United States. Uh, Matthew is a scholar of early modern North America, uh, exploring the relationship between indigenous power and the development of the British Empire. Uh, he holds a master's degree in history from the University of Oregon and a doctorate from the University of Pennsylvania, and he is currently a professor um, at the University of Chicago. <clears throat> now, so Matthew, thanks for agreeing to to talk to me today and welcome. Thank you for having me. So I um, wanted to just first tell us a little bit about your book. I'm going to show the cover here. No, it's fading away because of the, the thing. Uh, Time of Anarchy, Indigenous Power and the Crisis of Colonialism in Early America. So can you just tell us a little bit about the book? Sure. So um, uh, Time of Anarchy is uh, a book about the period, um, or a particular period of, of really tremendous upheaval in Eastern North America between the 1670s and the 1680s. And when I say tremendous upheaval, I, I really mean um, several interconnected uh, uh, conflicts or um, uh, episodes of disorder. And this included uh, um, either rebellions or civil wars in Virginia um, and Maryland, uh, as well as North Carolina. Um, it included uh, ethnic riots and separatist movements in New York and New Jersey. Um, so that was just on the colonist side among the colonists. Uh, it also included several, like each of those conflicts was related to um, wars that broke out between colonists and native peoples in all of those different regions from Albemarle Sound to the Hudson Valley. and. Those in turn were connected to a variety of conflicts um, and political reconfigurations between indigenous nations, uh, even leaving colonists aside. So my book really looks at the factor that links all of these different um, episodes of upheaval, which is the Susquehannock people, the, the nation of, of um, indigenous peoples to uh, um, the area of the lower Susquehanna Valley in what's now Pennsylvania. And, and what I argue is that uh, the Susquehannock people played a pivotal role, not just in connecting these events, but actually in driving them forward. Yeah, so I um, did hope we're gonna talk a little bit later about a, a period of uh, a Dutch colonial period, which is sort of the prior to the, the, the subject of your book, but you do touch it on, on it in here and the Susquehannock people uh, have played a a pivotal role in that uh, in the relationship of New Netherlands to the to the to the English and and the French and the native peoples, but your your focus, as you said, is on the Susquehannock people, uh, and it seems to me that um, that 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 nation has come under increasing study in recent years. Can can you tell me a little bit about how you came to this to the subject? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so actually, the the I have to say that the Susquehannock Nation, um, they've gotten, you know, they are getting some more attention than they used to, but not nearly as much as they as they need. Uh, the last time anyone wrote something specifically about them and just them was in 1968 <laughs> by uh, Francis Jennings. And um, mostly they they play uh, sort of supporting roles in articles and books that are about something, some larger issue. Um, so, you know, there's very, very much still a lot of room for uh, for more attention to this to this group. And, and I think that it's warranted because the, the Susquehannocks are probably um, what I like to tell my students is that they're they're the most important indigenous nation that you've never heard of. <laughs> uh, they're, they're one of the most significant um, drivers of, of politics and uh, and trade and diplomacy in um, across the eastern seaboard through the entire 17th century. And so there, it's really, really difficult to tell stories about any of the other areas that we talk about, whether it's you know um, English colonies in the Chesapeake or uh, New Netherland in the Hudson Valley and the Delaware Valley. Uh, it's really, really difficult to tell those full stories without including the the Susquehannock people. 
So I actually, um, I, I came to them uh, as, a, as a historian kind of by accident. Uh, I, I started out in the beginning of my graduate school career focusing on Virginia, and, and I was particularly drawn to um, the, uh, the conflict that broke out in 1676 called Bacon's Rebellion. Um, and this is, this is a, a huge part of uh, the classic uh, um, study of Virginia called American Slavery, American Freedom by Edmund Morgan. Um, and he has he has a whole section about the the sort of the causes and consequences of Bacon's rebellion. And, and there's a really curious part of of that of the story that Morgan tells, which is that, you know, he has about a third of the book uh, about the sort of the history of Virginia leading up to the 1670s, in which the Susquehannocks are never mentioned. And then suddenly they show up uh, to kind of spark the events that uh, become Bacon's Rebellion, which is a, a, a full-on political crisis and armed conflict um, between colonists, uh, different factions of colonists, as well as between colonists and the native peoples of Virginia. And then for the rest of the book, they completely disappear. <laughs> so, so, you know, within the narrative that, um, that, that Morgan and other historians of Virginia have told, uh, they they sort of come out of nowhere and and disappear and and you know they they play this cameo role um, that really piqued my interest you know I, I I wanted to find out um, who they were how they came to be in the Potomac Valley to play this role and um, if there was a better way of telling a story where they didn't just appear and disappear but actually were the center uh, the center of their own story. Okay, so. Uh... Just to, to build on that, uh, what what are the sources that that uh, you know as a historian you know historians try to rely on documentary primary sources you know traditionally uh, as the profession has evolved over the past few hundred years right what well, what are the sources that that help us uncover the history of a people who have left you know, little if any written records of themselves what's yeah, that's a great that's a great question, and that's a, a a perennial challenge for all historians of the um you know the period of uh, the 16th to the 18th centuries. Um, so, in the case of the of the Susquehannocks, um, they are actually documented quite frequently by Europeans. Europeans wrote documents about them a lot, or at least they appear in documentary sources a lot, but they don't appear consistently or um, in the places that you might expect. Uh, I think kind of like the, the narrative that Edmund Morgan was telling in his Virginia story, they tend to pop up and then disappear if you're only looking at one area, right? If you're only looking at Virginia, then they'll just kind of flit in and out of the story. And what I found um, is that you really need to cast as wide a net as possible in order to capture their full story, just because um, the, the nature of their society, uh, the kind of the places they traveled, the relationships that they built with both colonists and other indigenous peoples um, require that you look at uh, a huge um, array of different sources. And that includes everything from, you know, missionary encounters um, with Jesuits in, in like the area that was New France, now Canada. Um, there's Dutch sources, Swedish sources, sources, English sources in Virginia, as well as um, Maryland and New England and uh, North Carolina. Um, they actually show up in English records that um, I traveled to London in order to uncover, London and, and Oxford as well. Um, in they appear in the in very unlikely places. And I think part of the part of the challenge for the historian is just to to put all these together, to get a kind of um, you know, to gather all the puzzle pieces in order to try to 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 figure out what is the picture that they're that they're showing. Um, the other thing I'll, I'll add to that is just that uh, for the Susquehannocks um, uh, uh, in particular, perhaps, um, material sources, objects are uh, incredibly important. And archaeology and the work of archaeologists uh, was really important to to sort of to the process of of my research as I was putting together all of those different documentary um, all of those different documentary pieces, because you know objects can tell us things that uh, that documents can't. Um, in many cases, uh, uh, you know, archaeologists have developed really, really interesting and innovative ways of even just reading the spatial layout of a town or um, the significance of uh, the postures that people were buried in. Um, 
the the kind of the the significance of of um, how to understand the uh, presence of certain trade objects that came from far away, places as far away as uh, the Western Great Lakes, like Lake Superior. Um, how, how to put all that together, you know, the, the, the things that they can tell us about that are really crucial to understanding things that none of the documents um, really cover. Things like, for example, um, you know, the, the role that women played in um, Susquehannock society as, as village leaders and, and, and really important um, aspects of their military culture, in fact. Or um, I think the, one of the other things that, that archeology span has told us a lot, and, and again, I wanna give full credit to the, the archeologists who developed the methods to be able to do this, um, is to, to sort of to recover the ways that uh, Susquehannock's built a, a, a political structure to govern their society that was very, very different from what you see coming out of Europe or the colonies. Um, it was a society that was primarily based on the, the sort of the ideals of um, consensus, right? Uh, rather than having a kind of like a chief or a leader who would give commands and other people would follow them, um, the idea was that the community would face problems together and they would um, talk for a long time. <laughs> you know, they would go back and forth and back and forth uh, uh, with the goal that everyone would would finally kind of agree. They would get on board with the same course of action. And if that wasn't possible, then um, in many cases, they wouldn't do anything because, you know, it wasn't enough to have 51 votes out of 100. It You really needed everyone to to be on the same page and everyone to, to believe in the same um, the same course of action. And, and that has a whole bunch of ramifications for understanding just how they work, what their emotional worlds are like, how they relate to each other on a really um, fundamental level, on, on a level of families and, and, um, and, and sort of, you know, smaller communities. And all of that comes from, um, you know, innovative work in, in reading objects. All right, uh, thanks. So um, before we get into some more specific questions about the local area around here, what's now Jersey City. Um, just how would you say that the, the study of the early period of European contact with the indigenous peoples of North America has changed in, in recent times or within the past generation or two um, compared to what I might've learned when I was in grammar school back in the 1970s, you know, uh, to, you know, how, how, how has the field changed in your, in your time studying? Yeah, it's it's changed a lot, uh, and and you know there's always a, a a lag time between you know um, when cutting edge scholarship is produced and when um, scholars finally get around to really disseminating that in, among the larger public. So so there is kind mm -hmm. of that gap, but but e even just among academic specialists, uh, the last fifteen um, to twenty years have been uh, uh, transformative in the ways that we think not only about the contact period, but um, the early contact period, but but really just the entirety of uh, indigenous history in America, and and most of that has to do with the um, the growth of uh, the the discipline um, that is usually called Native American and Indigenous Studies or or NAIS for short N A I S, uh, and and this is quite new. Um, the professional organization dedicated to indigenous studies, um, which is NASA, the um, Native American and Indigenous Studies Association, was only founded in 2007. So just about, what is that, 16 years ago. Um, and it's grown explosively since then. And one of the things that uh, um, has come about as a result of, of NASA and all of the kind of uh, work that's gone into that is large numbers of indigenous scholars who um, have been encouraged to pursue academic careers in, in anthropology, sociology, history, political science, law, education, medicine, public policy, pretty much any discipline you can imagine. Um, they're all kind of, you know, they're being pulled together by um, indigenous studies as a method and, and NASA uh, as an organization. And, and, and one of the things that, that these scholars have, have been doing in, in large part is um, many of them write about their own communities, for one, uh, their own languages and, and cultures and, and histories and modes of thought. And um, that's been amazing <laughs> because those scholars have, have been able to challenge assumptions about native histories coming from previous generations of academics. 
and and again, because this is so new by previous generations, I mean just like you know twenty years ago. Um, but you know, if we go a little far back, uh, you know, most of those academics were were white, and and most of them were men, and and most of them, frankly, were relying on intellectual frameworks developed by nineteenth and twentieth century anthropologists that kind of assumed that uh, indigenous peoples were, were were primitive societies and and destined to die out. Um, and so, you know, that carried forward in, in well into the 20th century uh, in terms of the kind of the tools that, that academics were, were using to study the early contact period. And so, and so the, the birth and growth of indigenous studies as, a, as an academic discipline is, is radically changing uh, all of that. Um, so, so when it comes to the early contact period, I, I would say, uh, you know, that specifically, the effect of indigenous studies methods is really just getting started. But but you can already see the impact on on archaeology in particular. Um, so so just to give you an example, uh, earlier generations of anthropologists tended to use um, what was called a, a a culture history model for understanding indigenous societies, and and this was a pretty it was a pretty rigid framework um, that was where one of the default assumptions was that any indigenous people, uh, any tribe, right? Um, that's not language that most scholars use anymore, but uh, tribes were kind of solid and, and stable entities, um, right? That like a Susquehannock was a Susquehannock was a Susquehannock uh, and that they would kind of pass through these, you know, these stages of development, um, but didn't essentially change, right? They, they stayed who they were for, you know, um, however much time they were looking, you know, the anthropologists were looking at. So, so that culture history model was was a problem for a lot of different reasons. Um, for for one, you know, it really it held native peoples to uh, an impossible standard of authenticity that, in many cases, led to the loss of rights and recognition for modern descendant communities. Um, but, you know, even just looking at the intellectual sphere, uh, it was also just inaccurate <laughs> because it, it couldn't capture the flexibility and change that that all cultures undergo over time. You know, I mean, uh, ju just to choose a, 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 a sort of a, um, a, a random, you know, comparison, uh, modern people of the United States in 2023 are not the same <laughs> as modern people of the United States in 1790. Right, uh, a lot has changed since then, and you wouldn't expect that there would just be a sort of, you know, a, kind of a, a steady progression. You would have to to really pay attention to all of the different subtle factors that formed modern Americans. Same is true of of all indigenous peoples, uh, including those at the in the contact period. So, so nowadays, archaeologists are are exploring. Um, uh, the dynamism of indigenous societies, and, and especially when it comes to better understanding relationships between indigenous groups that are neighbors, right? Instead of seeing them as, as separate tribes that just kind of exist as, as blobs on the map, um, now we're looking at, at, at them as, as deeply interconnected networks of, of kin. Um, and so there's a, there's a whole cohort now of archaeologists studying the Susquehannocks in, in just this way. And uh, and I'm really indebted to their to their work because it inspired me to look at historical documents with fresh eyes. So uh, uh, I'm going to avoid the issue of of those who might want to find a unified uh, American culture from the uh, 1790s through through today. I think there are those <laughs> who would want to insist on that, but that would be a that's a topic for another time. Um, but I I was have been struck as I. I'm trying to find my way into this recent scholarship you describe that it's almost like um, understanding uh, uh, me medieval Europe, you know, in fact, you know, where you talk about the different nations and principalities that, you know, uh, and the, the, the conflicts and interconnections of, of, you know, those people, it's, it's, um, you know, it, I can almost see that you know it's an inter it's a question of international relations you know here in in the U.S. as as people you know uh, in cultural ethnic family bands tribes nations you know negotiate um, with each other over you know over over the resources uh, so. 
You know, I want to just kind of move more into, you know, specifically talking about uh, New Jersey um, uh, and this area, particularly in in northern New Jersey. I think a lot of your story uh, focuses on the Delaware Valley, where I, uh, you know, at the at the the other end of the state here. But um, uh, you certainly do touch on uh, on, on this area um, in New Jersey. We typically consider the the Lenape peoples as the primary residents here at the time of, of New Netherland and, and New Sweden settlements, uh, which really begin the history of European presence here um, in the 17th century. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the relations between the, the Lenape and the people of what's now New Jersey um, and the Susquehannocks and really had the relationship of both of those to the, to the Iroquois nations in the north um, back in the 16th century you know when European contact and infiltration was going on with with France and like as you mentioned before Canada and New England um, and the, the you know what's now Virginia the southern southern mid-Atlantic states um, uh, yeah can you just talk a little bit about that those international relations yeah absolutely uh, so the um the people who uh, ultimately became known as as the Susquehannocks uh, in the 16th century split off from the uh, the northern Iroquoian peoples who were who are the ancestors of modern Haudenosaunee. Um, Haudenosaunee, also uh, uh, known as the Iroquois League, although Haudenosaunee is their preferred term for themselves. Um, so over the course of, of several decades, uh, the Susquehannocks, after they kind of split off um, from there, migrated it down into the lower Susquehanna Valley and um, slowly, you know, over decades, coalesced into a large community um, that by the end of the century was a was thousand people plus. Um, over the course of that migration, uh, they came into conflict, violent conflict, with uh, peoples in the Susquehanna Valley who already lived there, in particular a group that archaeologists call the Shanks Ferry people. Now that's not what they call themselves. They're, you know, this is an archaeological designation that's named after uh, a, a site, a dig site. Um, we don't actually know what they called themselves. Um, but archaeological evidence, such as um, burial arrangements and, and pottery styles, uh, show that large numbers of Shanks Ferry people were, were captured in the course of these conflicts and then adopted into Susquehannock society. And, and when I say adoption, um, I, 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 you know, just to make clear, that was a violent and coercive process. Uh, it usually meant captivity and then forced incorporation into a new community. Um, but it also meant that they were they were considered family members of of the new Susquehanna community, and and the children of these adopted captives would have been considered full members of the Susquehanna community a generation later. Um, now, not not all relationships uh, were violent during this migration. There was also um, a sort of a, a process of peaceful alliance building that Susquehannocks undertook. Um, particularly in the first half of the 17th century, but that began, you know, much, much earlier, um, which resulted in a kind of a, um, both a larger coalescence of the main Susquehanna community, as well as a network of allies among Native peoples in the Susquehanna Valley and the Upper Chesapeake. Um, but, you know, one complicating factor here is that this is the same time period uh, that um, climate scientists call the Little Ice Age. Um, there was a sort of a, a climatic shift that resulted in, in global um, cooling of temperatures just slightly, um, but it was slight enough that it caused all kinds of, um, it put all kinds of stress on, on native societies because it affected growing seasons, um, changed kind of seasonal cycles, uh, altered game populations, and, and reduced crop yields in particular. So, so there was a lot of kind of resource competition that, that came out of this. And um, that ultimately led to, to sort of even, um, even more conflict around the turn of the century. So, so if we if we look specifically at the at the Haudenosaunee, um, you know, I mentioned a, a minute ago that uh, they ultimately kind of both descended from the same ancestors. Um, and it, as far as we can tell, uh, Susquehannocks maintained friendly relationships with the Haudenosaunee for decades after their migration into the Susquehanna Valley. Um, and in fact, they 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 formed a really um, long uh, uh, long range chain of exchange 
that connected the Western Great Lakes to the Atlantic seaboard. And in particular, the, the Great Lakes area produced copper, um, which had spiritual powers associated with the sun and was sacred to many Algonquin peoples uh, on the Atlantic coast. And the Atlantic coast in exchange um, produced wampum. Uh, wampum was strings of beads made from quahog and whelk shells. And when those were woven into belts, wampum was a sacred object that recorded the histories of, of native peoples and played a vital role in uh, gift giving ceremonies that, that formed diplomatic protocols. Um, so that alliance uh, continued for a long, long time. Although for reasons we don't understand, it, uh, it ruptured around the turn of the 17th century. Um, this placed the Haudenosaunee in a really difficult position because they were cut off from this, you know, Atlantic um, kind of, you know, trade, um, the Atlantic end of the, the, the trade route, and um, isolated them. So uh, that partially helps to explain why Haudenosaunee were so keen to establish relationships with Europeans farther north in the Hudson Valley and the St. Lawrence. Um, there's, a, there's a similar story with Lenape's, only kind of in reverse. Uh, in the early 17th century, competition over access to resources led to warfare between Susquehannocks and Lenape peoples along the Delaware River. And um, probably as well farther north, although this is mostly documented in the Delaware River specifically because of English explorers. And, and those English um, uh, explorers were, um, well, they witnessed and, and reported uh, devastating Susquehannock raids, uh, particularly against um, Mantis and Armawamis bands of Lenapes. Uh, but um, within a relatively short period of time, by the 1630s, uh, Susquehannocks and Lenapes had, had not only made peace, but had actually formed a new trading alliance, um, which was probably a result of their mutual desire to strengthen their hands when it came to establishing trade relations with European newcomers. Um, so I can say a little bit more about that, but but I will say uh, uh, just in closing that because Lenapes were allies of the Susquehannocks by this time period, that also unfortunately made Lenapes enemies of the Haudenosaunee, and that enmity intensified over the following decades. Right. So, um, so when you know Henry Hudson makes his famous uh, voyage of discovery and and and. Uh, investigation of the, the North River and now the Hudson River. Uh, the uh, the native peoples that come to see that that see him know what you know know what it is that they're seeing. They're they're there. It's not uh, like an unfamiliar uh, presence. They sort of knew who Europeans were, although there what there hadn't been a lot of significant uh, intrusion into this particular area. Is is my understanding. Uh, so once the uh, this area is claimed uh, for Dutch settlers um, along the, the Hudson River in the 17th century, uh, this became a real sort of complicating factor in these economic systems and trade that you were talking about and alluding to before, uh, which had risen between Native peoples and the French and English. Um, uh, so can you talk a little bit about how, you know, the, Hus the Susquehannocks adapted to this new, new player, this new, uh, uh, you know, this new factor in the Mid-Atlantic region with, in New Netherland? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and, and first I'll, I'll just say, you're absolutely right that, uh, there was nothing particularly new, uh, about Europeans when they showed up in these areas, uh, even though, you know, Expeditions like that mounted by Henry Hudson and, and, and similar, um, you know, kind of famous explorers were better documented than earlier encounters, but they certainly were not the first. And, um, you know, we have all kinds of evidence that uh, because of the rich fisheries, cod fisheries off of Newfoundland, um, European fishermen and, and traders were coming in by the hundreds, right? We're not talking about small numbers, but hundreds of ships per season were crossing the Atlantic in order to engage um, at first in fishing, but then in small scale exchange with native peoples along the coast. So uh, th there were extensive contacts, even though we don't have a lot of um, documentary evidence of it. Although 
again, this is where archaeology plays an important role because we do see all kinds of objects that start filtering slowly through native communities and through native um, trade networks that are coming from not large scale mercantile enterprises, but just kind of one or two or, or three people in some cases uh, who are, you know, um, offering whatever they have or, or whatever kind of small pieces of desirable goods in exchange for, you know, a few furs or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And so, and so absolutely, when, when Europeans like Hudson arrive, it's, it's just, we should think of it more as a kind of, um, a continuation of relationships rather than something that's brand new. So, uh, so one thing that that definitely happened as a result of of European arrival, arrival in in sort of significant numbers, and 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 again, um, arrival in terms of these large organized enterprises um, like the the Dutch West India Company. Uh, one of the effects that that had was that it put it, it intensified the competition for resources among all of these different native groups. Because all of a sudden it wasn't just about um, hunting grounds or or crops or um, you know the kind of resources that they had already been you know had had been um, stressed by the Little Ice Age, but now it was also access to European marketplaces and all of the different kinds of very valuable manufactured goods that European traders were were bringing into the Americas. Um, so uh, Susquehannocks tried. Um, Susquehannocks were very eager to establish relationships with these newcomers. Um, this started very early. Actually, uh, one, the, the first encounter between Europeans and, um, and Susquehannocks was in 1608 between uh, Susquehannock leaders and John Smith of the Jamestown colony. Um, and when the Dutch arrived in uh, the sort of um, the Delaware Valley in the 1620s, uh, the Susquehannocks also welcomed them. Um, also welcomed them um, when they established the Dutch outpost at uh, Fort Nassau, which is just kind of across the the Delaware River from um, Philadelphia. I think probably in the area around Camden, um, somewhere somewhere near there in New Jersey. Uh, about about a decade after that. Um, the the new uh, uh, the Swedish South Company um, established New Sweden in 1638, and Susquehannocks also welcomed them when they built Fort Christina in modern Wilmington, um, and so they really weren't discriminating in terms of uh, you know Susquehannocks didn't see this as a as an exclusive relationship that they had to pick only one of these uh, of these European groups. Um, Europeans did see it as exclusive, which caused a lot of problems because they competed with each other, um, sometimes violently, uh, to um, you know prevent European rivals from accessing territory, from um, trading with specific native groups, including the Susquehannocks, or even just from um, traversing waters, you know, in order to get um, to transport one route to another. So Europeans really made this problematic uh, for Native peoples because they saw it as a zero-sum game, whereas Susquehannocks really saw this as um, something inclusive. You know, as far as, as, far as they were concerned, uh, relationships with Europeans was a situation where the more, the merrier. Um, so as, as a result of that, well, actually, let me back up. I, I, I won't just say as a result. One of the things that, that's important to recognize is that the Susquehannocks were a really large and, and powerful group. Um, so in many cases, you know, the, the European traders that were arriving, even the large mercantile companies like the West India Company, um, they didn't have the power to enforce their will on, um, on the Susquehannocks. Uh, you know, I think we're, we're, we often tend to, to understand the colonial period as one in, of, of European domination over native peoples. And it certainly becomes that over time, you know, especially when we get to the 18th century, the 19th century. Um, I don't want to diminish the kind of the violence that was connected to that, that process. But we often think of it, I think, uh, um, we often think of that as happening too early. And when we're talking about the 1620s, 1630s, uh, 1640s, it's really native leaders who are who are in many cases calling the shots in terms of determining balances of trade, determining um, where Europeans are going to settle. Uh, in fact, uh, the the um, the colonists at, at New Sweden were so dependent on the Susquehannocks for their survival 
that uh, the historian Karen Kupperman has has described them New Sweden as basically a Susquehannock colony, right? That that Susquehannocks were, you know, were just um, expanding their 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 community, their um, territory by using these Europeans to do it for them. So all of this made made the Susquehannocks one of the best connected indigenous groups in in the 17th century, right? By by 1650, they had alliances. Um, with, with Virginia and Maryland and the Chesapeake, with New Sweden and New Netherland. Um, they granted land to all of them. Uh, and I say granted because it wasn't land sales. Um, Europeans often described it that way, but natives didn't actually sell land. What they did was they granted rights to, to hunt or plant or, or travel or trade over certain territories. But um, but those rights weren't exclusive. They were they were shared with many others, both European and indigenous. But access to to those four different European marketplaces made them the the wealthiest native groups in the region, um, including wealth in the form of firearms and gunpowder, which was one of the most important sources of power in in an increasingly dangerous world. So those kinds of trade goods. Um, when used as diplomatic gifts, were partially one of the reasons why Susquehannocks were then able to craft alliances with other native groups um, in the Delaware Valley, in the Hudson Valley, and even farther beyond. Okay. Um, all right, and of course the, uh, the 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 Dutch take over New New Sweden. Uh, uh, towards the end of the New Netherland period, it becomes uh, uh, under. Uh, Dutch administration, and so there's that integration there. Uh, before, in turn, ceding the whole thing to uh, to England in in favor of uh, keeping Curacao, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, you know, so this this uh, what was going on here. It was sort of a sideshow to the European wars, you know, the Anglo-Dutch wars and the uh, and other European wars that sort of flavor that um, different view of the rights to to trade that, that you're talking about. Um, just really uh, so many rabbit holes you could go down here. It's fascinating stuff. Um, but now I just want to um, just, you know, one more one more question one more point uh, to get really specific um uh, you know on page 33 of your book you you uh mention a brief scene you know that the the Susquehannocks negotiating with Peter Stuyvesant on behalf of their indigenous allies uh of course Peter Stuyvesant uh looming large in the history of Jersey City here because um you know, in the aftermath of the Keefe's War, named for his predecessor, and then the the Peach Tree War, two two uh, conflicts uh, between uh, the Native peoples and the, and the Dutch here, and to some extent between Native uh, peoples and the Dutch, uh, uh, he Peter Stuyvesant established or caused to be established the village of Bergen, which becomes the first chartered municipality in what's now New Jersey, uh, which is in Jersey City's current borders. So, uh, you know, Peter Stuyvesant looming, looming large here, although uh, he didn't come here himself and some, you know, local partisans might want to mention Thielman Van Vleek and uh, others who are actually here. But um, I did want you to maybe talk a little bit about that moment of the, the Susquehannock negotiating with Peter Stuyvesant um, on behalf of the, their indigenous allies. And so, you know, and, and how that shows light on this complex politics between, um, you know, Muncie speaking Lenape, particularly the, the Hackensack, uh, and then the Susquehannocks and the uh, Iroquois nations. and I, what we'd call the Mohawks, uh, you know, just all of that. What was going on here in the uh, in the mid 1600s? Yeah, um, as you say, it was uh, it was extremely complex. Um, <laughs> it was a it was a kind of international relations that really had no center. It had all kinds of different um, different groups jockeying with each other, and and uh, 
<laughs> it's it's it, it really becomes um, it really becomes an an incredibly uh, uh, difficult story to to sort of to un unpack just because the groups that we're talking about are so small in many cases, and there are so many of them, therefore, all following their own agendas, um, that it it really helps to look at these stories on a on a local basis. So I, I sort of appreciate you you know zeroing in on um, on on this particular area. Uh, so, so one of the ways that that Sanspahanics, um expanded, like I was saying a minute ago, was um, by using the power of trade to exert diplomatic influence. Right. Um, essentially, what they did was they used their economic clout to position themselves as as peacemakers or or mediators. Right. Um, so that that's exactly what they did with the Hackensacks. Uh, you know, they had been, the Hackensacks were one of the groups that Susquehannocks had been creating kinship relationships with for, for decades. Um, and, and those networks, I think, showed when it came to negotiations with the Dutch. So, so just one example um, is uh, 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 that one of the proprietors of um, what's now Staten Island and the part of Long Island in the Bronx um, was a guy named uh, Minkwa Sachemak, right? And he actually signs the deeds that um, that grant this area to New Netherland. Mm -hmm. um, and Minkwa Sachemak was a Hackensack leader, but but his name literally translates as Susquehannock chief. <laughs> um, and wow. and I think that, that that's a, a a kind of a reminder to understand again the interpenetrated nature of these different groups, right? We call them Hackensack and Susquehannock as though those are completely different entities, but actually we you know we have to understand that they're enmeshed at the level of of individuals like Minkwa Sachemak. So so both internally from from guys like Minkwa Sachemak um, and externally through formal diplomatic relations. Uh, the Susquehannocks used their influence to encourage an alliance between the Hackensacks and the Dutch, which was formalized in, in 1649. Um, so I think you know that was that was one case of of um, of the sort of the multipolar uh, 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 alliance there. One one that you know um, was positive in the sense that it you know it it created a new uh, a new friendship and new trade relations without violence being you know directly involved. The, um, the the case that you mentioned on on page thirty three of of the book um, involves kind of the opposite. It's when it's when Susquehannocks are trying; they're actively uh, intervening in open warfare between the Dutch and Esopus groups in the Hudson Valley, and and in that case, they're they're you know they're intervening again using their economic clout, essentially by um, trying to to convince the Esopus and the Dutch that uh, if they don't stop fighting with each other. Then, um, then maybe the Susquehannocks will take their business elsewhere. That that's kind of the implication. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, that's putting it a little a little crudely, but but you know, they really are trying to bring these different groups to the table um, in a way that allows them to expand their influence in this informal kind of you know diplomatic um, trade related way. Um, so you know. But the thing is, is that uh, the the violence of the Esopus Wars was was not at all out of um, out of character for this time period. I mean, there was tremendous upheaval and violence across the entire region, um, and you know, one of the manifestations of that that had really, really uh, powerful impacts um, across a huge area of geography was that the Haudenosaunee nations um, began raiding their neighbors in the late 1640s and 1650s on a scale that had never happened before. Um, and the Susquehannocks were among their many targets in the 1650s. Uh, and at the same time, um, Susquehannocks sometimes had problems with Europeans who, who didn't know how to behave properly. <laughs> so, you know, as you mentioned before, uh, you know, in 1655, the, the Dutch conquered New Sweden, right? They had been jostling over that territory in the Delaware Valley, you know, for over 10 years, 15 years. Um, Pretty much since the Swedes first arrived, uh, but they had been competing, and um, you know, by by 1655, the Dutch, you know, finally like uh, um, enacted a military conquest of of the the Swedish territory, and the Susquehannocks did not appreciate this attack on one of their most important allies. Uh, so one of the things they did was, in order to teach the Dutch that they can't behave this way, they they punished the Dutch by participating in an attack along with Lenape's and, and Muncie's against Manhattan. Um, at the same time, you know, the uh, uh, 
the, the Susquehannock Lenape alliance was really critical to um, both of them surviving this period of Haudenosaunee raiding. Uh, in 1661, just to pick one example, there was a large Haudenosaunee attack on the main Susquehannock town. Um, and hundreds of Lenape warriors helped repulse that attack. Uh, so, you know, they really had to work together um, in order to sort of survive this, this period of, of upheaval. And I will say that that the kind of, you know, um, to close the story out at the, the, the period when New Netherland becomes New York, um, the English conquest of New Netherland in 1664 was really a major blow to the Susquehannocks. And, and the reason for that is that the administrators of New York, um, who wanted their colony to be profitable, they made the kind of the, the real politic calculation that the Haudenosaunee were a more important ally and economic partner than the Susquehannocks were. So um, they just kind of cut the Susquehannocks out. And as a result, the Susquehannocks lost one of their most important sources of trade and, and support. Um, after 1664, the, the only European partners they had left were Virginia and Maryland, and those are the colonies that ultimately betrayed them in 1675 when the Susquehannocks needed them most. All right, well, I think we'll, we'll uh, since that's not a New Jersey story, we'll just leave that as a tantalizing story to uh, attract people to pick up the book, uh, Time of Anarchy. Indigenous Power and the Crisis of Colonialism in Early America. Uh, but I really appreciate you taking the time uh, to, to talk to me and sort of shed more light on the, uh, the complex politics of uh, European and Native American relations um, in, the, in the early colonial period here. And uh, yeah, appreciate the conversation and thanks. My pleasure.